it has to do a whole lot of communication. And uh, as we started this whole process, one of my suggestions was if we had to get this across, it's not only going to be within United Methodist Circles, it is also going to be across our denominational partners and ecumenical partners. Uh, but having to do with this protocol in particular, I think there is, we need it to do effective communication and marketing of the protocol. Unfortunately, up to this point, uh, the, the protocol has not yet been translated into the general conference languages, especially in French and Portuguese, and a substantial proportion of the membership of the delegation are coming from non-English speaking countries. And they need, they need this document for them to be able to understand and interpret it themselves. That has not yet been done. And that is one key issue. That's one key thing that we need to do. And I have this protocol translated and then sent out to everybody, especially to the delegates who will be voting. There is also a need for us as bishops on the continent and the delegates for us to come together. You see, Africa has been polarized, you know, by the vast the geographical differences between other conferences, the huge miles across places that you have to travel. And I think of bringing these delegates together, together with the bishops and the leadership, for them to really study and understand the implications, you know, of the protocol, especially as they're being also translated into legislations and petitions. We need that. Fortunately, there is one way out with the general conference or uh, the global church now working on uh, an orientation for central conference delegates at least two days before general conference. I think that would be another forum that we will be able to discuss this. But to me, it might be a little late because then once we get to general conference, as the case is always, you have all of these groups catering calling for the attention of the African votes. That's always what has happened. And, and so the delegates will not have had enough time to comprehend, understand, and internalize all of the implications for them to know where to cast their ballots. I have tried throughout the negotiation and uh, the mediation process to remain faithful to our original statement that we made some three years back and that, uh, in Zimbabwe, that one, we will not condone or endorse any legislation that calls for the, that calls for the dissolution of the church, and two, we will not support any will not support any legislation that we call for, will not support any act of homosexuality in the church, and we do not support the ordination of uh, self-avowed homosexuals. And three, we will remain United Methodists, no matter what. So consistently throughout the process, uh, we attempted to be very faithful to those three. And at each one step we took, I was sending information to the rest of the other members, my colleague bishops, and I think they are well satisfied that we tried to do the protocol within the framework of what we said we were going to do. And so a good number of them are saying, yes, Bishop, that's a good job. We thank you for that, for your faithfulness uh, in representing us. Uh, we see there are one or two others who are still a little bit as always, you don't expect in a process like this, we don't expect 100%. There are one where I may, be say, I may say one who is saying, well, that's still not enough. We see we have to do with homosexuals. But then in the issue, then, then this whole idea of regionalization annuls that because it gives us a unique opportunity as an African continent to do church the way we want to do it, as traditionalists. And that one nobody is going to take from us because we are traditionalists. And all we are trying to do is to save this church from further chaos and all of the pain and all of the anger and uh, all of the abuse 
that we experienced in 2020, uh, in 2019. And it's like we were saying we don't want to go back to 2020 to rehearse or go over and repeat the same mistake we did. Right from the beginning of this conversation, I think every African bishop and uh, key leadership on the continent became aware of the fact that we are journeying into an uncertain future that we all don't know. Yes, the plans were there for five additional bishops, making a total of 18. But they also were aware of the fact that uh, with this new process, with this debate that is going on, if we are able to, and when we finally resolve it, we will not have enough membership in the church to contribute the quantum of resources, financial resources that we need to maintain 15 bishops, but even not only the 15 bishops, but also to engage in other mission activities across the continent. So we are poised for that, we're ready for that. Uh, once all of this is turned into legislation and petition, then we all go back to the drawing board and uh, begin to see how best we can approach that. Already GCFA approached me uh, as, an, as the incumbent chair of the Standing Committee on Central Conference Matters to inform us that there may not be resources for 15, for five additional bishops. And uh, we are seriously thinking about that. It could be, I have no idea how that's going to be, but maybe reducing the number of bishops. But then that was if the church remained together. But now that there's going to be separation, that could be even be a far much more different scenario altogether. And so it's a very uncertain feature that we're all you know, leading into. But I trust in the power of the Holy Spirit because you know, Jesus emphatically said that he will build his church upon the foundation against which the forces of Satan will never prevail. We might not have the money to do all of that, but mission and church work is not only about money, it is about faith. If the people can come together with some degree of unity and say, we can make a difference, we can. And so one of the things the African continent started talking about is to engage in intentional investment in agriculture. Uh, we have vast quantities of land in Africa. The church possesses huge quantities of land in Africa over the years that we have not been able to make use of. Maybe this could be an opportunity, and that may be because then we are receiving you know, resources. So we never thought that these land resources we are sources of income or you know, for us to run the church. But now that this has come upon us, I think it's one of those ways we go back to the drawing board and say, well, wait a minute, can we not make use of these land resources? Can we not invest in the agriculture? Can we not invest in estate development? And that takes us to quite a different way of doing church because we've never done that before. It means we might begin to look out into the secular world where to find people who we want to sponsor or fund those programs. And uh, I still remain hopeful. The challenges are there, but I still remain hopeful that somewhere along the road, we will get there. Well, Isaiah 42 speaks to me very clearly on this when, you know, God says, uh, I will be with you no matter what, you will walk through the water and you will never be drowned. You walk through the fire and the heat will not scorch you. And we hold on this. We are at a time when we're walking through turbulent waters as a church. We are at a time when we're walking through fire, uh, through difficulties. But I remain very much convinced and persuaded that God is still with us. And this is what I've kept on telling my colleagues on the, on the table that, uh, this is God's church. It's not our church. And whatever happens, God is going to take his church to where? To the place where he wants his church to be. So it's really not about us. It's about we saying to God, here are we, Lord. Use us, send us, and use us to the best of your ability for the good of your church.